الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين We're continuing to uh, cover the very important issue which is good manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and today we are covering one very important aspect of this issue which is to show enough respect for what Allah has shown us to be of importance or greatness in His eyes. And the word in Arabic is ta'zim hurumat Allah, that you show enough respect and you honor what Allah has honored and you respect what Allah expects you to respect. We know that even before the commission of the Prophet وسلم, the Arabs used to try to abide by the four months, the four sacred months in which Allah has made fighting prohibited, which are called Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum. Hurum means Idham. Al-Tahrim huwa al to say that this is haram, it means it is something ominous in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot violate what they call today in red, in red language, it's a red line. And we use the same thing for giving importance to some buildings. We say al-haram al-jami'i, the sacred campus, haram, jami'i, which means a place that is exclusive for just learning. Uh, we say, uh, as in the hadith, the Prophet وسلم, speaks about what is haram and what's halal as hurumat, hurumat Allah. And the Quran, in, in the same surah, in Surah Al Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يُعَظِّمْ حُرُمَاتِ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهُ خَيْرٌ لَهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ He who shows enough respect for what Allah has magnified and made important, then he, it is good for him. It's not for anybody else. Following a couple of ayahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ He who honors and glorifies and respects uh, whatever rights that Allah uh, expects of us to do, then he has exhibited the taqwa expected of him. فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ So what we need to focus on today is the fact that uh, it's quite unfortunate to note that many of us, by way of laughter and joking and uh, things of this sort, we do not show respect. In fact, we show that we are mocking our own religion. Uh, you note know this in the jokes that you hear sometimes in the public media, sometimes in public square when people meet together and the, the most laughable jokes are the jokes made about either uh, sheikhs or uh, the Quran said this or the day of judgment or the grave or what angels do and do not do in the hereafter. All of these fall under disrespecting what Allah expects us to respect. And when we demean our own religion, we are actually demeaning ourselves as if the opposite is really true. When you respect your own faith, you are actually respecting yourself. But because those hurumat, when we talk about salah, 
And sometimes people joke, Sheikh, are you not going to combine Isha and Fajr? Which is known to be a mocking of the Sunnah of combination. It's, it's nothing but mocking. But people take it lightly and they think they are funny. They think that this is funny. I'm trying to bring example that we live with here in this masjid so that we're not talking about other people or non-Muslims or the black media. We're talking about what we Muslims are doing when it comes to showing respect. The Prophet ﷺ was uh, in a trip and uh, they were going for a battle and he instructed the group with him, the companions, to break their fast. It was Ramadan, he said, break your fast. So some of the youth who thought that this is for old people, they thought it is for old people, those who cannot fast while fighting, so they didn't break the fast. When the Prophet ﷺ heard about them, he said, أُولَٰئِكَ الْعُصَى أُولَٰئِكَ الْعُصَى أُولَٰئِكَ الْعُصَى These are the disobedient one. You cannot and should never take the word of the Prophet lightly. You have to give it respect. And you have to give Allah the respect He deserves. So that we are not among the group about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ They have not appreciated Allah the way He should be appreciated. So making fun, whether it is what you think or name or label as a light joke and Ya Shaykh, don't be harsh. You know, people say this but they don't really mean it. But this is what is called Laghu, at minimum. And at worst, it is disrespect for Allah and for His faith and for your own religion. So we have to be careful not to cross this line and not to attack our own faith by teaching our environment, whether old or young, that it is okay to make a joke about salah. It is okay to make a joke about the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise, people who deliberately go ahead and divorce their wives and in the process of divorce, they say, I divorce you, right? And as if they didn't believe themselves, they say it again, I divorce you. And if they didn't believe themselves a second time also, then I divorce you. Now, he thinks that he has divorced his wife because he said it three times. Of course, this is laghu, this is playing with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if you believe yourself in the first time, you said, I divorce you, whom are you divorcing the second time? It just doesn't make sense. But it comes as a package of the customs and habits that we inherited from a society, unfortunately, that is not raised or taught what real Islam is. What real Islam is should matter for us. It should matter that we learn our deen. It should matter that we apply what we learn. We apply what we know. That shows how much respect you have for the knowledge you have and for the source of your knowledge, which should be Allah and His Messenger. So when it comes to respecting, respecting what is haram, Muslims have developed the habit, unfortunately, because we have so many fuqaha that can give you what you ask for, give you what you want. We have the habit of keep asking until you get it. Keep asking until you get it. One of the major issues that is obviously haram by everybody's definition is the issue of riba. Is there anyone here who doesn't know that riba is haram? Of course there is none. There is none, young or old. But then, is there anyone here who knows what is the definition of riba? Very few people know what the definition of riba is. But among those who know what riba actually is, which is the added payback to the loan that you get from some source, the added payback, if it is a condition in the contract, it is defined as riba. If it is a condition in the contract, it's defined as riba. Why do we keep asking if I can buy something through a riba loan while we know that riba is haram? 
it just skips me as to why do we keep asking about this? Because we are hoping that one day, one sheikh will tell us it's okay. That's all what we have. But if we are afraid, if we see what is haram as hellfire and a sign towards hellfire, it will be scary to get close. It will be scary to get close. The Prophet وسلم, to illustrate for us how serious it is to get close to what is haram, he gives us the example. He says, مَثَلُ الْقَائِمِ عَلَى حُدُودِ اللَّهِ the example of someone who is violating the limits of Allah and the one who is not are like a man grazing his sheep in a land. And the land is divided. There is a line that divides his land from the land of the neighbor. So the Prophet Sallallahu says, if he grazes close to the land of the neighbor, even in his own land, he cannot control that his sheep will run into the neighbor's land and eat from where they shouldn't. Okay? So, he goes on to say, أَلَا إِنَّ لِكُلِّ مَلِكٍ حِمَا Every king has a mark or marketed land to call his kingdom, his position, his property. Right? أَلَا إِنَّ حِمَا اللَّهِ مَحَارِمُ The protectorate the lions for Allah are what is made haram. Ala fattaqu maharim Allah. The guy who grazes his sheep close by, huh? it is like somebody who is on the verge of getting into haram and he doesn't even want to observe or know that this is serious. So he gets closer, inching, inching, inching until he falls into what is not his. And that's why in the way Allah prohibits things, there is always a message that we need to pay attention to. And I don't know if I explained this before, but it doesn't matter to repeat it. When it came to killing, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't kill each other, don't kill yourself. And the expression here used is, kill yourself because when you kill your brother who is part of your soul you are actually killing yourself so the expression is don't kill yourself he doesn't say don't kill each other no don't kill yourself so the killed and the killer come from one soul and the expression is intentionally magnifying the value of the other as your own value Allah wants to see that person like part of you like yourself. But then when it comes to something like zina, adultery, Allah SWT doesn't say don't commit zina. Allah says, Wala taqrabu zina. Don't get close. Don't get close. Look again at this word. What is more of a prohibition? To tell you don't do this, or don't get close to doing that. Which is stronger? Of course, when I prohibit you from a distance, I'm protecting you from falling in something serious. Okay? But the seriousness is not the issue here. Because killing is worse than zina. Even though morally, both are abhorrent and unacceptable, but killing is more serious. Okay? So it is not the seriousness. So what it is about zina that makes Allah prohibit it from a distance and not at the point of contact? It is because it's a slippery slope. It starts with looking, just mere innocent looking at someone. That innocent first look, nobody can prohibit it because you, you can't prohibit your eye from catching somebody. But the second look, the look of investigating, the look of lust, the look of inquiry, is what is prohibited. So the Quran ordered us to lower our gaze, that you lower your gaze, do not extend that second look. 
Why? Because the second look will be followed by the third look. And then the look that is never going to end. And then it will develop desire. And once the desire is developed, interest in the person will also follow. And once you become interested in somebody, you either get it through what is halal, or you will do it through what's haram. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even after that, you liked somebody, fine, go marry her. Go marry her. But if you don't want to marry her, then cut it off. Cut it off. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits us from taking those initial steps of looking and developing interest and lusting and all of that so that that slippery slope does not drag us all the way to the valley of sin and adultery and this unacceptable behavior. So likewise you see the way the Quran prohibits wine and gambling. So we know now that as far as zina, because it's a slippery slope, it is like if you talk about the example of the man grazing his sheep, when the next door neighbor in the next line of land, when his land comes on a slippery slope and your sheep go to that slippery slope, it is difficult to get them back. But if it is flat, maybe you can call them quickly. But grazing close to that line is itself an invitation to violate the borders and the lines that are not yours. So when it comes to wine and gambling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ وَالْأَنْصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِجْزٌ مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَجْتَانِ بُوُ Wine and gambling, casting lots, and other jahiliya methods of choosing your luck are rijz, which means they are impure, they are najas. Rijzun min amal shaytan They are made by the shaytan's hands. Then what is the order? Fajitanibu. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. When, when you know that there is a place that plays anything of gambling or engages in anything of drinking or anything like this, the Quran says, stay away. As far away as you can. Don't get in. Don't say, I was, just, I'm, I was just looking for something. I was just looking for a friend. I was just looking, I was gonna ask him something. Don't get in. The Quran is saying this, why? Because both gambling and alcohol, they are not only a slippery slope to more sins, but they are so addictive that you can really pick yourself out of it. Once you get in, it is like a closed box. It's very difficult to get yourself out. So Allah uses the language of prohibition to show us how ominous and how serious a violation is so that we heed we heed his command we heed his warning and we pay attention also when it comes to something that we started to see a lot of laxation in is the women dress coat from a full-fledged jilbab that does not show the shape of the body, the color of the body, the size or anything, just any cloth that is covering the body from shoulder to toe. No, now we started to see that hijab, what is called hijab, which is not the right term anyway, what is called hijab has become only a head cover. Even that head cover doesn't even cover. So, when we take Allah's commands with this kind of laxation, we end up with a society that honors a belly dancer as the exemplary mother. If you don't believe me, read the news. How could a society go that far down that a belly dancer becomes the, 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 the exemplary mother? 
Is this what we want our children to learn? That if she wants to be an exemplary woman, she needs to follow? But it is when we degrade and denigrate our faith and our practice and start to have a different type of norm. And then some people say, Al-Urf, she, she, she is earning her living. So this has become a career, a job. And now there are schools to teach your daughters if they want to become belly dancers and to become exemplary mothers to join the school, apply. So we have to be careful. What are we doing to our faith? What are we doing to our religion? What are we doing to our next generation? How much respect is left for the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the society collectively decides such decisions? What does it tell the younger generation? It tells them that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When people are still arguing until today, does Islam have a say, which in essence, a very serious joke. Uh, does Islam have a say in public matters? Or is it up to us? Does Allah have a say in governance? Does he have a rule for us by which we should govern ourselves? Does Allah have a say in the justice system? Does Allah have a say in the way we get married? In the way we do divorce? In the way we transact business? And you get, unfortunately, people who believe, no, he does not. As one of our late president in Egypt used to say, la dina fi siyasa wa la siyasa fi din. There is no uh, religion, which means there is no say for religion in matters of politics, and there should be no say for politicians in matters of religion. I don't know, how could anybody who, and unfortunately this guy, he happened to know the Quran quite well. He used to memorize it as a young person. How could he then make that statement in front of a nation that is more than 95% Muslims and get by with it? How do we start accepting the unacceptable and turn it into a way of life instead of accepting Allah? It's simple. It is when we discount Allah's statement, Allah's position, Allah's instructions from our heads and from our hearts, then the words of people become important. So many of us hear and read and watch the media and what do we talk about the most after we hear the news? He said, she said, he did, she did. But when we hear the Quran, it doesn't steer similar discussion. We all hear the Quran. You rarely find somebody who comes and says, I heard this in the Quran. Can you imagine? I am amazed by this. Uh, it's kind of like a discovery for me that the Quran is talking about this issue and this is what Allah is saying, this is what we need to consider, this is what we need to do. Why? Because we pass by the Quran cursory reading. But when it comes to other things, we give it attention. The attention that we give to something elevates its value. It means that it is more valuable to us than other things to which we give no attention. And if we give attention to what Allah says, if we appreciate His word, if we appreciate that He is talking to us to protect us primarily from us, primarily, Allah wants to protect you from you and then from others. If this is what we understand Islam to be, then Allah will bless our life and our life will be different. But we have to start at the point of valuing what Allah values, to give it the right value. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us, وَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ الْقَيِّمِ Direct your face to that religion that is full of values. It tells you 
what value and how much value do you place on something? So the Quran gives a very high value to our love of Allah. A very high value to our love of the Prophet ﷺ. Very high value on listening to Allah and His Messenger and obeying them. Not to be like others who said, we hear and we disobey. We are the Ummah that should say, we hear and obey. Allah gives very high value for parents in the eyes of children and for children in the eyes of parents. Allah gives very high value for your neighbor, be him or her a Muslim or non-Muslim. We should value what Allah values. Allah gives very high value for living a peaceful, decent, cooperative, lenient, relaxing, happy life. We all say we want that. Where is this? It is in your hand. If you follow Allah, you lead a happy life. If you follow your head and your mizaj, your whims and desires, you live a miserable life. Since when could man manage his or her life better than his creator? Since when? Show me a single thing that man has done that can even be compared, whether it is a system of anything. There is no such a thing. The only system that can bring happiness, stability, consistency to the human life is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. When do we start respecting those sources, the Quran and the Sunnah? When do we start saying, if Allah said so, I'll stop here? When do we develop the habit that if the Prophet ﷺ made that position, then I will stop here, I will adapt his position. And why not? What is so difficult about it? The only difficulty is it sometimes runs against our desires. It runs against our desires, we have to be honest. But this is why if you want Allah to work with you, you have to work with Him. Align yourself with Allah and His Word, your life will be different. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us align our life with His commands. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ولانا محمد عبده ورسوله وبعد Brothers and sisters Life is so short to maneuver around the orders of Allah سبحانه وتعالى And our fate is only shaped one time and once we live here, there is no chance we can change our fate. And the train has left, and every day our life gets shorter. Every one of us is hanging on a string. One side of it is in your hand, and the other side is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That string is getting only shorter every day. That string of your life is getting shorter. You're getting closer to your end every single day, every single hour. And Allah gives us our life in segments of days. Every day you go to bed. Count yourself as a dead person until Allah returns back your spirit to your body. And it only happens once a day. So Allah gives us this life in segments of days. And those segments could actually be much shorter because in reality we know you can take a breath and never get it out or you can get it out and never get it in. So the, the threat of facing our fate on an instance is great, which means the value of what you do with those moments that you call my life 
is even much greater than we give it appreciation. So even if we are forgetful because we don't see Allah with our eyes, some of us don't, right? And we don't see him even with our insight, some of us don't. But at least we see people dying who were our neighbors or relatives or friends. We see people leaving this life and from time to time we carry them to the grave. That should be a strong reminder to show us the value of our life. So even if the shaitan works against your will not to value Allah, at least value what he has given you. If you value that, you use it properly because your life is your only path to the hereafter. The only path to your hereafter is this life, short as it may be, or long as may you think. But at the end of the day, you have to use it according to the manual. And the manual is the Quran, and the maker is Allah. He tells us what to do with what he has given us. Allahumma hdina fi man hadayt, wa'afina fi man afayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt. اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا كربا إلا نفسته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا ضالا إلا هديته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته ولا حاجة لنا من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة لك فيها رضا ولنا فيها صلاح وفلاح إلا يسرتها وأعنتنا على قضائها يا أرحم الراحمين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة